Okay, welcome. This is our first Blender Clinic special, and today we're going to be talking uh, about tracking, masking, and comping in Blender. We only have an hour, so let's get to it. Uh, so I'm just going to go to new. Oh, I already messed it up. New VFX. Uh, this gives us this sort of uh, tracking panel layout, and we can open our footage directly into it via that little button there. I'm going to load in some Creative Commons footage I downloaded from a Blender Cloud. This footage is pretty ideal for a tracking uh, tracking test. It's on really well lit green screen. It's got loads of tr tracking markers, relatively no low noise, um, and um, compression wise, it's not too bad. Uh, and also, it's already been broken down into an image sequence. So when I when I open that, you can see this is an image sequence. So hit A, select all, and open clip. Um, Basically, uh, image sequences work better for tracking because uh, rather than operating with compression like group of picture compression that some video formats use and various other tricks they do to make the video file smaller, you know, um, images are, every time you open that image, it, unless you're saving it uh, on a lossy image, then, you know, you're getting the same image every time and therefore tracking is going to be more consistent. Um, that said, let's jump in. Set scene frames. This basically sets the uh, the start and end point of your project to the amount of frames in your shot. Hit prefetch and it will load all of that footage into blend into the memory so Blender can access it quicker and you can scrub back and forth to your own. Halves content. I'm gonna change my end point actually to 240. Numpad's not turned on um, because I don't want to do the whole shot. We've got very limited time. That seems pretty good to me. Now, um, a couple of things to mention. Uh, so tracking points. Tracking points are really important, but you know this. This is something I didn't know up until uh, a little while back, really. Um, tracking points only record the location of the point. It doesn't matter if it's a location, rotation, scale tracker. They only ever record the location, okay? Um, these motion models, location, location, and rotation, lock, lock, scale, affine and perspective, they don't record rotation data, they don't record scale data, and affine and perspective, whilst they skew and attempt to model based on distortion, they don't record that distortion. What these are, are basically, tracking is all about pattern recognition. So if we have a tracker on here, and we're looking, uh, this is what the tracker sees, yeah? So um, it's looking for this pattern in every frame, and it's going to move a point to that pattern um, and, and it, it's trying to do that by using location or by using location and rotation to keep matching that image. So if your camera's twisting like that, then it, the, the, the pattern will appear to rotate and that's what it's following. And if the camera moves in closer, then, uh, you know, it's scaling up. So it's using those um, distortion methods and transformation methods to try and match the image. It is not recording that information it is only recording location, okay? A fine and perspective also allow for skewing uh, and distortion, and a fine is probably the most appropriate uh, motion model to choose when we're creating tracking points in Blender because it's good in most situations and it's fast, um, okay? So uh, the other thing you need to know is this side, and this trips me up all the time, yeah? This side is purely the settings for new trackers. Once you've created a tracker, so if I change this now, it's not changing this tracker. It's changing the data, the, 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 it's changing the setup for this new, the next tracker you put in. If you want to change this tracker, that's over here. So I changed that to previous frame. This one has not changed to previous frame. I have to do that over here. So this is purely for the creation of new trackers, and this is how you edit existing trackers. This is important to know because it will catch you out and trip you up all of the time. Anyway, with that said, we'll deal with the rest of it as we go through. Okay, so um, keyframe's good for, for, for now. Um, now with this, I'm going to actually, I'm going to use, right, so it's, <laughs> it's control and click to add a point. S to scale the point, R to rotate the point if you wanted to do that. And G, uh, well, G is to move it around. Um, so I'm just going to use G, point it there. You can also do some finer corrections here. I'm going to choose this side of where the pole meets the tennis ball. And I'm going to scale it down. The reason I'm doing this is I know that this red tracker is coming for this. 
And at some point, that tracker will get in there and it's going to confuse the pattern recognition because this red point that didn't exist in this space is going to get in there and it's going to break the track. So if I scale this down, move it over here, there's a lot of contrast in this point to track and we don't need to worry about that tracking point coming in, yeah? Except the only thing is I'm now in the middle of my thing. I really want to do it from the start, so let's do that. So uh, yeah, so control click, there we go. And we can just track forwards by clicking this button. And as you can see, it tracks all the way through. And you can see what it's tracking here. And it's done a great job. Now, I'm trying to track the camera. I need to make eight solid points from beginning to end of my scene in order to track the camera. So let's add some more. One. Two. It's also worth noting that having tracking points on the floor is really going to help me later because I want to be able to match a floor plane uh, in the scene. So yeah, knowing where the floor this is, but we're going to use these points to create um, a 3D approximation of this in, in 3D space. It's going to extrapolate all of that out. It's very impressive and very clever. Now, what we don't want to do is track anything on these guys because they're moving. Um, they're going to move around and we, we need static objects to make a camera track. So I'm going to select all of these. Um, and Blender is so blazingly fast at tracking nowadays. Just do that. And I mean, I'm not speeding this footage up. That's just how quick it is. And we now have over eight points. We could actually go from here and, and, and that's, you know, that, that's enough to make the camera, but we're not going to do that. We're going to be clever and we're going to go to annotation. And we're going to draw and I'm going to draw around these guys because as lovely as they are, also incidentally, this, this chap over here, that's Ton Rusenthal. He made Blender. Uh, this footage is from Tears of Steel, by the way, a short film that they made a few years ago when they were developing visual effects. It, it, visually, it's still great and it, it, it's great fun to watch. It's a bit of a hokey film. It's a little odd. Um, but yeah, it, it's still one of these things. It's, it looks so much fun to work on. Um, anyway, annotation. And yeah, so we've created this annotation thing and we're going to use it as a mask. So we're going to click detect features and we're going to say in this pop-up panel, outside annotated area. And now it's only going to detect stuff outside of that area. Um, so this is basically automatically choosing points to track. And I'm going to take the distance down. And look at that, it's created loads of points. Well, it could have created more, but I think that's that's an appropriate amount. And now uh, with them all selected, we're just going to track backwards. And we're gonna start losing points rapidly as they go off the edge, but some of them survive all the way through. Now these points don't need to survive all the way through because, uh, you know, they, well, they, they just don't. We've got over eight trackers, which go from beginning to end. And these are just additional information. What we do want to do is whilst we're here is, is as these fall off, some of them might jump or jitter. So we're just going to find those things in the tracker and we can see a little aberration here. And that's this tracker. So we've, as I've clicked on, on that point, you can see this one goes white. That's the active tracker. So I'm going to use this button, which filters selected or all. So it's like, do I want to see the graph mapping, um, so I should explain the graph in a second. Do I want to see the graph mapping for, for all of the points or just one which is selected? With that on, it's only going to show me the information for this tracker because that's one that's selected. Um, so basically we've got two different uh, graph lines. One is the X and one is the Y. Uh, so the X position and the Y position for each tracking point. That's all this is. And when you see a big jump like this, you can pretty much assume if all the trackers aren't jumping with it, then then something's gone wrong, okay? So uh, it looks really good up until here, but from there on, I don't want it. So I'm gonna hit this button and that deletes everything going that way, just as this one deletes everything going that way. I'm gonna undo that because I do want that tracking information. Uh, again, I'm gonna select all and we're gonna go through and if we see any more aberrations, like that one looks a bit, a little bit off. And we can see it's that point there. 
Yeah. It, you can see here what's happening. Let's get rid of all of that. The rest of it, it's tracked nice and smoothly. Okay, so that's really good. Um, something else, just to uh, just to show, uh, there's another feature I'd like to show you. So I'm going to track from here. Also, it's worth noting on versions earlier than 2.93 of Blender, um, tracking backwards way slower than tracking forwards, but sometimes it is necessary. Um, but it was fixed in 2.93, I believe. So, uh, yeah, and I say way slower. Blender is so fast that you probably won't even notice. It's so fast at tracking, it's insane. Uh, so we've got this point. Now, as this goes forward, because you can see that, that light, the bloom from the light, it changes what this is going to look like. So what we can do is we can click normalize. Normalize, uh, it, it normalizes the light levels of, uh, of the pattern that you're looking at. I can also scale this up and hopefully that pattern is going to be a little bit more recognizable. Also, I'm going to change it just so that it's tracking the blue channel because there's so much more contrast in the blue channel. Uh, I figure that it might do quite a good job. In fact, let's also just go here. Right, and we're going to just track that. See how far it gets. It's it's kind of gone wrong. It's kind of gone wrong. So what we could do is, I mean, it's kept really tight to there, to about here, and I'm going to delete the rest of that track. Now, it, normally, if you if you lose a track and it refuses to go past the point, so we can just track forward again. Where it breaks at that point, you can just go back and just hit scale, and normally it will track forward again. You see? So you can you can correct it like that. But what you are gonna do in this case, as you can see how far it's slipping, is it, it's going to go it's gonna go bad. It's gonna give us bad data. It's better to have fewer accurate tracks, fewer more accurate tracks than lots of inaccurate tracks. The more inaccurate data, the more it's going to skew our model. So to there it's pretty good. Um, what I can do is I'm just gonna correct the uh, pattern here and like I said this track is only recording location data all this skewing and stuff doesn't matter it doesn't change the final data it's just how it's how it recognizes uh, our our image and I'm going to change this to previous frame and what that's going to do is rather than when you first set up your uh, your point and whenever you use G to move that point around, you create a new keyframe. And it's always referencing that frame and trying to match the next image to it. Previous frame will just go from this frame to the next frame. Let's match what's under the tracker in this frame and find it here. And then when it gets to this frame, it takes what's under the tracker in this frame for the next frame. And so it has this continuous thing. So if a point is constantly changing and mutating, previous frame will track it, but it is a little more sloppy than the keyframe uh, style of doing things. So anyway, with that in mind, let's track forwards and see how it does. Pretty good. There we go. A far better track than we than we had previously. It's still a little sloppy, but hey, me likey. Um, so with that in mind, I think that's enough track points for the camera. So I'm going to select it all. And what we're going to do, we're going to go to solve. We don't need tripod. This isn't a tripod move. This is a, it's a dolly and it's a dolly and a boom. Uh, so yeah. And I'm going to let it re refine the keyframes itself. And the keyframes, in this instance, what that means is it takes two keyframes and it takes the X and Y axis, the, 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 you know, the X and Y motion of each point and compares them over two frames and extrapolates the depth. And in that way, it creates a 3D model of our scene, essentially. You're going to see that later. It's super powerful. It's saying that... Um, I, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's impressive and I like it. So uh, we're going to let it choose its own keyframes and we're going to let it refine all of these. Why not? I don't actually have the metadata to tell, the, normally you can tell Blender, uh, you know, the, uh, the camera's sensor width 
and the aspect ratio and the focal length. And this is really vital information for Blender to know, but I don't have any of that information because it wasn't included in the metadata. God damn you, Blender Cloud. Um, either that or I'm too stupid to find it in the metadata, which is also possible. Anyway, we're going to solve the camera motion and let Blender decide what those values are. So I'm guessing about a 35 mil, 35, uh, 35 millimeter sensor with a 35 mil lens. Uh, 35 mil sensor and uh, yeah, approximately a 35 mil. Yeah, there we go. The years of photo my, my photography degree finally paying off. Um, you know, except for all the awards I didn't get. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, right, anyway, so uh, now we've got a camera solved, um, and it did it did say solve error 2.6 pixels. It normally comes up down here as well, but I was too slow to catch it. Um, and so that's really good. Anything under one pixel is pretty slamming. So we're going to set up a scene as a background and set up uh, the tracking scene. And it creates all of this nonsense. So I'm going to create another 3D viewport over here. Yoink! And I'm going to hide this temporarily. These are just objects to place in our scene. And what we want to do is uh, we've got all of these tracking points, but they are parented to our camera, which means we move the camera and they move too. So I'm going to go seven on the numpad to go overhead and dot, uh, sorry, full stop, and choose 3D cursor. That's now my pivot point. I also want these on. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to spin this around, right round, baby, right round. So it's in line with this axis. This is purely for my own convenience. This is for my convenience. You know, I'm, I'm adjusting where stuff sits in the scene. And I can adjust the scale as well if I wanted to. Um, I'm adjusting it so that it makes just makes more sense to me. Like, I know that these pointers, if I select these two points, you can see these are the tracking points from here, from the floor, yeah? So I know that these two points are or should be ground level. So let's take them to the ground. And I can scrub through and go, this is on the ground. Yeah, that's approximately on the ground. And what else? This is probably on the ground. Yeah, so if I, uh, again, got my camera selected, just going to rotate this. And we're looking approximately, you know, we're looking at something like this okay i think that's pretty good and what we can see when we start to, to zip around our scene we can see these are the microphone stands or, or the boom stands the c stands there we go a century stand if you want to know their full name uh these century stands or c stands uh with boom arms and tennis balls on the end that's them you can kind of see their shape you can see over here where I tracked the light. So that would be somewhere where we can put a light into our scene. In fact, let's do that now. I'm going to, with that selected, snap cursed selected, shift A, add a light, spotlight, and I'm going to point this towards the camera. In fact, I'm going to adjust it over here as well. So you can, whee! Okay. And, uh, you know, we can go to our lights or options here and we can choose the color of a light and pick. Actually, I wouldn't do it in this screen. It's uh, not showing the full color values there. It's all grayed out because of how it displays with the background images. But I can choose from there and we're getting this slightly yellow, warm light. And it looks to me like an Arri 1K, uh, Arri Junior 1K or an Arri Junior 2K maybe. Something like that. So I'm going to put it to a thousand watts just as a starting point. Remember, we're cheating things here. We are making stuff up. We are extrapolating information. It, that's just a starting point for us to work with. If it doesn't look right, you take it down, you change it, you tweak it. Um, you know, these are not scientific measurements necessarily. Um, it's all good. So. so there we go. We can see our light is tracked into our scene, and that is great. Uh, I'm going to go Alt H and bring back these um, objects we had. Uh, I'll hide that one again, actually. And we're going to zip out. Actually, I'm going to turn this to wireframe rendering. Select these, GG, to slide them along the axes. And GG. Okay. Actually, you know, these cameras, the camera's looking a little bit wonky. So let's select this. 
active element. And I'm just going to... There we go. Get rid of some of that wonk. And we've lined that up approximately. Now this strip here, this this is... I actually thought this was another wall. But it's not. This is just um, some fabric uh, to cover some cables, I imagine. Uh, but, I mean, if we wanted to, to line this up... I mean, it doesn't make sense to do it, but... It'll help us visualize our track, I suppose. I can... Oh, no. I could always just drag that again, GG. In, and you can see that it matches approximately there. I'm going to unhide our cube. Kawoob! Scale it on the y-axis. Pull it up. And where were those? Yeah, there's the two points which were, you know, where the drop cloth met the floor. Snap cursed selected. I'll set the origin to there actually. Okay, now. Doing this in a very clunky fashion. I do apologize. But, you know, anyway, this is, it's not about, it's just about demonstrating stuff. Wowee. Anyway, so that's, that looks something like that. And now if we scrub through, you can see it roughly matches all that stuff, which is great, you know, good stuff. Well done. Um, what else can we do? Well, we could... Uh, extrude up some walls. That'll probably be useful later. Anyway, so we've got a camera, we've got a scene, um, we can we know approximately where we can place stuff within that scene. Uh, but what we need to do now, uh, well, we need to track our object. So we're going to do that. We're going to go to track. Over here, the camera is what we just did. Hit plus, oh, excuse me. Uh, and we've created an object track and we'll call it box. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to track this funky wee fella here. Um, track. I, pardon, I have to apologise. If you can hear all this noise, it's uh, it's been crazy all day in the studio. So uh, lots and lots of noise. Um, so now we're doing an object track. So it's uh, we've got the camera track, and now we're going to track this motion. And Blender can sort of go, oh, okay, well, we'll you know, it can keep those pieces of data separate. And working together, which is great. Um, we're going to have to do this pretty quickly. Uh, oh my god, I can't believe all the noise today. It's insane. Um, I'm just choosing um, these points, which I know will won't change too much. So, like, I, you would think if you chose this red ball, then this would be great. But look at this: red, then green. Yeah, we pan, we go through. And then, because the angle changes, it's now red, then beige, it, it, or, you know, wood and skin. And, and that's going to confuse the tracker. So, you know, be kind to your tracker. Choose a point like that, which is going to be consistent throughout. So I'm choosing where the balls meet the... God, that sounds wrong. Where the balls meet uh, the wood. Oh, God, that... Yeah, I just I just said that. Um, now the good thing about uh, about that is also that we are you know this plane the level of that plane is more useful to us than an arbitrary point on these balls. <clears throat> and yeah, okay, I've got all of those. So let's just track forwards. All of them bar one succeeds. 
This one I knew would fail, to be honest. It's because Beardy Man gets too close. So what we're going to do is just... Yeah, and now it's worked, um, which is great. So we've now got these points. What are we going to do with all these lovely, lovely points? Well, we're going to make an object out of them. I'm going to make an honest man out of them. Oh, what? Oh, wolf. Okay, I'm losing my mind. So um, what we need to do is solve this, solve object motion. Again, keyframe selected, solving camera, solving reprojection error. Um, and that's good. Uh, and then we're going to come out just so we can see what's going to happen here. And we are going to uh, do 3D markers to mesh. And what happens is you can see um, that basically a mesh that is just a handful of vertices, a vert on every single empty um, of that track has been created. So each point in space now has a point of geometry. Um, I'm on two, frame 240, good, okay, but if I track through, if I scrub through the footage, you'll see that it doesn't follow it, it doesn't do anything at all. So I'm going to go back to my frame 240, and I'm going to add, with the mesh object selected, I'm going to add a constraint, and I'm going to add the object solver. I'm going to choose our object track and our camera, and it's disappeared, but if we hit set inverse, voila! It's back. And then when we scrub through, you can see these points in space now are moving with the track we just made. So back to my camera. What can we do with that? Well, um, I'll start with these two points here because why not? So I'm going to go into edit mode, select, do as I say, go into edit mode. Ooh. I suppose it helps to be Oh, I had the wrong selection mode. I need to be in vertices selection mode. So I'm going to select these two points and I'm going to hit F to fill them and that will create an edge between the two points. I'm going to hit E to extrude and just drag that up slightly. And now we've got a plane um, roughly aligned with these points and what I can do is just drag them out to the corners of this bit of wood. Log, log, as big as heavy as wood. Log, log, is better than bad is good. Better Ren and Stimpy for you. Now, I know that these points will be roughly aligned on the x-axis with the um, uh, with the trackers that they were ex extrapolated from. So I'm just going to tweak it up a little bit. And hopefully now when we scrub, 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 <laughs> as big as heavy as wood. Okay, now we're getting some drift there, so let's have a look at why. Much better. Okay, so what we've got now is that we've got a 3D plane that perfectly matches that piece of wood. So we could add a texture on top of that if we wanted, or we could replace that, uh, or build something in its, in, in, its, in its place. So now we're going to do that with this box. Box, box, as big as heavy as wood. Box, box, as big as bad as good. Sorry, uh, I have definitely lost my mind. So what we're going to do, we're going to take these three points and hit F. It creates a face for us. We're going to then, uh, again, extrapolate these points out to meet the edges of our box. It would be better if we had tracking points on these corners. Perfect tracking points on the corners, but we don't. I'm going to then take this edge. I'm going to subdivide. And drag out a corner to there. Okay, now I'm going to look at this plane and go, yeah, the plane should be flat. So is that approximately right? It looks okay to me. And if we scrub through, it'll, we'll soon know. Yeah, that looks all right. I mean, maybe it could be better. Maybe you've got more time on your hands than I do right now. Face select. Face select. And I'm going to change this 
transform orientations to normal. So we're basically, we're projecting outwards. And I'm going to hit E and extrude and then escape and then grab the arrow, just pull it along. And now we've basically got a box, but we can see on our box that it's snap cursor selected. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. So we could either rotate from this base. Yeah, and that all that seems to have done that. Oh, but now this is all misaligned. And that looks good to me. So now we've got a, basically we've, we've got this box has been replaced in 3D space. Siri trying to chirp in. Um, and you know, you could sculpt that, you could, or you could replace it with something you've already sculpted. Um, and that way you could get a robot, a digital hug from this man. What a prize. Okay, so we have an object in space. One thing we also might want to do, let's, let's just shrink this camera down. It's absolutely mahusive. There we go. So we're just, don't scale it. Use the viewport display over in the camera options and you can scale the actual represent, the empty representation of the camera. Okay, I'm going to put a 3D object in here. Just going to make it a cube, scale it down. Bring it up. Okay. Upsy daisies. Control Alt S. Alt S to yeah, Alt S. There we go. And we've created a pillar. Yes, that's right. And that pillar is going to get right in the camera's way later in the shot. Okay? So now, yeah, we've got a 3D scene. What do we do next? Uh, well, a good point would, it would be a very good point to save it. Track, test. Okay, and with that saved, let's just switch over to a compositing view. Now, when uh, you created this, the, the, you went to File, New, VFX, it created a compositing setup. Uh, and it also created two collections, background and foreground. Now. This is for a very specific reason within compositing, but I don't like how it's doing it and I want to show off the new Cryptomat nodes. So I'm going to put everything into the background. I'm going to delete, delete that because stuff it, who cares? Let's delete that. We will skip this one. Oh, something else to, to note, uh, preferences add-ons, make sure you've got Node Wrangler enabled, okay? Because that allows you to go Control, Shift, and click. And that will connect any one of these nodes to the viewer. And that's pretty important because uh, it allows us to actually see what we're doing as we're doing it. Um, so now we've got the rendering, which is here. Also, we can zoom out the background there so our nodes are over the top of our image it's not it's a bit clunky but it works um so it's got these undistortion nodes and scale nodes which we don't really need necessarily but we'll leave them in uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to key the image so shift a search keying and i'm going to select a color and that's keyed out that color. Now, you can play with these settings. Um, in fact, I'm just going to show you a quick thing. Control Shift and click, and it will cycle through these ports. Now it's showing us our mat. If we go further along, you'll see there's some gray values in there, which I'm not overly fond of. So I'm going to take the clip white down, move the screen balance, try and get rid of some of those. Clip black up a little bit. Um, 
actually I'm going to click it again to go to edges and this is important edge data isn't affected by clip black and white it's it's an, you know it's trying to refine the edges um, so anything that is considered an edge is removed from a clip black and white <clears throat> so you want to make sure you've got your edges white right first so we're going to turn up our edge kernel and you know change the uh, the radius if you want to I think that's pretty good um, and then yeah control click back to matte and I'll clip white that's pretty good uh, we can also add a little bit of feathering click back through to image okay so now we've got a fairly decent key it's all right you know I mean you could spend some more time with that you could add a ramp over here and all sorts of jazz anyway <clears throat> that is is going into our alpha over node and being combined with our render layer but we can't see anything just yet so we're going to hit f12 to render the image get rid of that and you can see that it's totally gone over our image uh, so what i'm going to do i'm going to swap these ports around and now our footage is on top we'll convert pre-multiplied um it's getting hard to tell what's what however because you know there's not enough light in our scene so we'll go back to and we might as well go back to motion tracking um and you know if you were to scrub around this footage you'll see that there's actually a big area diffusion light over in this corner and a couple of par cans and all sorts of bits and bobs uh, really don't know how i was i was rotating that in the most cack handed fashion we want to point it over there it's about there and I mean 20 watts is it, it's, it's actually a bounce it's a bounce diffuser and there's another one over here uh, I'll back this one off a scooch um, because this one as I recall it the shadows are a bit more prominent from that one uh, anyway um, so I'll hit f12 again okay that's rendering a bit more so you now we can actually see the background a bit better but what we have got uh, which you know green screen can't help us with is these light stands so this, this light up here we've got Ton Rosenthal the inventor of blender in the shot which is, you know, always a bonus as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, in this instance, fuck Ton. Let's get rid of him. I don't mean it, Ton. So uh, what we need to do is go to masking. I mean, you can also do this in motion tracking and just tab to change this to mask. But we'll go to masking because it come, it's, it's already got the dope sheet set up here with the mask stuff on. So we're just going to choose the footage from there. And we're going to create a garbage mask. Uh, control click and just start control clicking around your man okay and there we go um, one thing I forgot to do was turn on auto keying I'm going to select everything uh, turn on auto keying select everything and then G just to give it a jiggle and it creates a keyframe what we need to do now is scrub forwards right to the end set another keyframe okay and what we're trying to do is keep him within uh within the the lines at all times but cut all of this junk out anything that's going to interfere with uh our key um that way the green screen has got to work a little less hard and that's good because green screens are lazy anyway Oh, his fingers. I'm just doing this incredibly roughly. You can do this roughly too, but, uh, you know, there are going to be areas which are going to need a little bit of TLC. So be prepared for that. I'm going to select all. I'm going to change to 2D cursor and just tap the pen over there. And I can now scale from that point which will help us to adjust stuff. I can use B to box select and move stuff on mass. Again, using the G key will allow you to move 
S to scale, R to rotate. And keep going. Okay. We're nearly there. So a very, very rough. Do we lose some fingers there? Maybe, who cares? It's only a finger, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, all the way up to 240, we now have a garbage mask. Um, and that's great. Uh, you've got um, various things you can take a look at here, but we don't have time for that today. So you can really look into, into more details about that mask if you want to. We're just going to add it to our shot. Um, and this is where we say goodbye to Ton. I'm going to shift A to add a new node. Search for mask. It gives us this mask node. I'm going to choose the mask that we just created, which is called, you guessed it, mask. And uh, I'm going to just plug that mother lover right into the garbage mat over here. Oh god, we killed him. And it's deleted our guy. Um, so to fix that, we'll just uh, add another node, invert. And we're inverting the RGB because what this is is actually spitting out, this gray dot is saying we're spitting out a black and white mask, a black, black and white image, black and white values. So we're inverting the RGB, not the alpha. Uh, so yeah, it, it comes out as by default in the correct way. Don't be fooled, even though we are technically inverting the alpha, um, when doing that by inverting the RGB. I could make that more confusing, couldn't I? And then I'm going to hit F12 again just to render, because <clears throat> whilst the compositor, you can set it to auto-update um, the compositor node, it, you need to render the animation first in its entirety, technically, to um, be able to see the frame. So every time you move the frame, you need to hit F12 to update that render. But you can see that now we've cut out 90% of the garbage. And uh, if we keep hitting F12, you can see that we've got a tracked shot. We've got a tracked shot keyed and garbage masked. And it's all working really well. Um, the only thing that isn't working is this post that I stuck in front of our man, right? That's rendering in the wrong place. It, it needs to be it needs to be rendering in front of him. So what we can do is um, we can come over to here. And this is only in the latest versions of Blender again. So Cryptomat, if you don't see this, then you need a, a more modern version of, of Blender. Or there's a million other ways to do this, but this is the way I'm going to do it today. Cryptomat object. Cryptomat allows you to choose mats, to pick mats from objects and materials, <clears throat> and it's super powerful. I'm just going to delete the render layer and add it in again, because now we've updated this. Ugh. And now I added in, you've got these crypto objects. They're nothing to do with uh, non-fungible tokens or any of that bollocks. Uh, no, this is just... Yeah, yeah. It's something very totally different and doesn't uh, harm the environment, so... Use it at your leisure. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Crypto, man. There we go. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to connect the image up to here and crypto mat object up to here. I'm going to shift, I'm going to select it and shift, click, shift, control, select it as well. I'm going to hit F12 and <clears throat> nothing happens. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift, click, shift, control, click again until it comes until it gives us the pick option, okay? And I'm going to add a matte object, and I'm going to select uh, this blue pillar with the eyedropper. Okay, and then I'm going to tap through, and suddenly we've got this image that is perfectly alpha and matted out, and that'll go through the entire animation, yeah? So what we can do with this is connect up our alpha over, so this, okay, and I've changed that image to pink just so we can see which, which, what's where. Okay, and so this bottom node is the top and that one's the bottom. 
There we go. That makes a lot of sense. I'm just going to plug my crypto mat, matted image into that node and it is going to drop it on top of the existing uh, imagery. And as you can see, that works just lovely. We'll just scrub backwards and hit F12. And you can see it, it works consistently throughout. So that's that, really. Um, what else can we do uh, with this? I mean, plenty. You can add in lights, you can sculpt stuff, you can add textures, and, and everything that you can do in Blender, you can now do in uh, in your scene. You can, you know, build a, a CGI reality around your footage. Uh, the other thing you could do is actually drop the footage into the 3D space and, and avoid a compositor altogether. Uh, Ian Hubert does some wonderful tutorials on that, um, so check him out. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's it really. I mean, I think I've covered enough. So uh, I'm going to call that a day. I'll just render this out or save it. And I'm going to set this to render. Just render on the desktop for now. Um, and I will do that thing that you're never supposed to do and render it to a video. Okay, and I think we're good. Save, render animation. Okay, and as soon as that's done, I'll show it to you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. This has been, uh, I've been Chris McFall, uh, this is Blender Clinic, and yeah, this is a little special edition on compositing and tracking because it's it's one of those things which a lot of us never even touch in Blender, and it's super powerful. It's one of the best trackers out there, uh, in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's, I, I prefer it vastly to even Mocha, which is the industry standard, um, largely because of how it allows us to recreate um, the 3D footage just right there in the viewport in Blender. And so quickly we can start generating 3D assets um, which match the footage, you know, and, and replacing those 3D assets with the footage uh, in, in the footage. And, you know, and then we can comp it all together. It's so insane that this software is free and this powerful and wonderful. I've been using it for over, for, for about a decade now and, and it still amazes me. So, uh, that's why we're doing a special on this. It's something that I wanted to get back into and I, that felt, you know, and to be honest, it was one of those things. If anyone asked me a question about, uh, about this prior to me doing this tutorial and actually getting my head straight about it, I don't know how I would have answered that question. So uh, there we go. Anyway, enough waffle. Thank you very much for tuning in. I uh, hope the background noise wasn't too awful. And uh, we'll see you all soon.